Okay, it looks like the logins are starting to level off. So why don't we go ahead and get started? So hello, everyone. Welcome to Ask the Grant Writing Experts. I'm Dr. Meg Bouvier. You know me as the creator of your library of NIH grantsmanship courses. I have over 35 years of experience at NIH as an applicant, an intramural researcher, a staff writer, and now as a full-time NIH grant mentor. I've helped clients land over half a billion dollars in federal funding, and I'm here to answer your questions. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. So just a reminder that um, if you are attending live, you're in listen-only mode. So um, you can type your questions into the Q&A box. You can start doing that right away. We're going to do a mini tutorial today. Um, and I did get a couple of mail-in questions, um, emailing questions, but um, feel free to start loading up the Q&A box with questions. Um, if you are watching this as a recording, um, today is October 2nd, 2024. Everything that we talk about today is true to the best of my knowledge. Um, but um, first off, things change very quickly at NIH, so you should always check to see if anything has changed. And of course, none of this is meant to um, to replace um, careful investigation of the NIH um, uh, instruction manual, SF-424, um, that your NOFO instructions and scoring criteria, and a discussion with the program officer. So none of this is meant to replace that at all. This is just kind of a casual discussion um, among us. So um, what you should be viewing in the library right now, um, I would imagine that if you have a February deadline, you're done. So um, I, I know that I'm done <laughs> with all of my February deadlines. I mean, uh, February, um, October. You know, I'm already thinking about February So uh, because I've started working with my February applicants already. So um, my October deadlines are done. Um, I am finishing up with my November deadline people, which is all the resubmissions. Um, but this is the time of year where I start to shift gears and think about February, the upcoming cycle. So um, that's why I have February on the, on the mind. I'm already starting to work with my February applicants. So um, I think it's never too early to start prepping for an application. So. I'll say that if you're working on um, a resubmission for the November deadline, you may want to check out master resubmissions. It's newly recorded. I just updated it um, at some, I think I, toward the end of August, I think I did the um, the update for that. And um, so that's recorded and in the course library. And if you are a um, cycle one applicant, then you probably want to register for boot camp. So boot camp is coming up, and Riley has um, put in the chat box um, read two registration links. One of them is for Master the K series, and one of them is for Master the R series. So if you are a K applicant for uh, 2025 deadline, feel and you and you have you have to have access to the to the virtual course. If you're somebody who has a membership that allows you access to Master the K series. Feel free to register for the live boot camp that's going to occur um, on um, subsequent uh, Thursdays throughout um, October. And if you're an art applicant for 2025, feel free to register for the live boot camp, um, uh, which um, there's some overlap between them. So um, feel free to use those registration links. October is the only time that we include a K session. The K session will focus on how to write the candidate section. Um, so if you are a K applicant, um, you know, it's, it's a good time to, to register. So um, we would love to see you there. So um, that starts the K, the candidate section portion starts on uh, a week from tomorrow, October 10th. And then the um, research strategy component, which both the K and the R applicants should attend, um, are the four um, Thursdays after that. So that would be October 17th, 24th, 31st, and November 7th. They all start at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So um, if you have access to Master the R Series, you're eligible for the four sessions of the Research Strategy Bootcamp. If you um, have access to Master the K Series course, then you're eligible for all five sessions, including the candidate um, uh, session, the candidate section session. Um, the other thing that I'll tell you is um, we, um, because people really like AGE and a lot of people attended and watched the videos, both on our open YouTube channel and within the dashboard, um, um, we have heard from a lot of people who would like to attend live who can just never make it on Wednesday because they have like clinic hours or teach or whatever. Um, so we implemented something called First Fridays, um, 
which not surprisingly is on the first Friday of every month. Um, that's at 1130 Eastern. It's basically open office hours with me. So um, you can register for that as well. That's a separate registration from this these sessions. So Riley put that registration link in the chat as well. So I would love to see um, uh, people there. It's a much more relaxed session. It's not recorded. I don't have guests in many tutorials. People show up and if you want to um, talk over an issue with me, um, I unmute you and we have a conversation. So it's truly like office hours, one-on-one -on -one advising. Um, and we're just going to keep running them through the end of the year and see what the interest is. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. We'd love to see you guys at some of those sessions as well. Okay, so it looks like people have loaded up the Q&A box, which is awesome, but I think we're going to start with the um, with the mini tutorial because I am just, now that I'm thinking about February applicants, which I am officially doing, I am like itching to talk about the new scoring criteria in depth. So let's begin by doing that. All right, so... For the mini tutorial today, it's going to be on factor one, the factor one scoring criteria. Next week, I'm going to do factors two and three. So let me do a screen share um, just so that people know. You should be able to see um, my screen share now. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen this, but just so that we're starting from common ground, um, this is what we're talking about right now. And, and since about 2008 or so, um, there, there have been five scored criteria on NIH R series grant applications, and they were significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. All of you know this. I, I, I would be very surprised if you didn't know this. Starting for um, applications with deadlines on or after January 25th, so that's going to be all of the cycle ones. It's going to be the, the February, March, you know, um, R and K series applications and their resubmissions. That's going to change. So the way it's going to change is that significance and innovation are going to be um, collapsed into factor one importance of the research. And that will be a scored criteria, but it's a single scored criteria. It's not broken out where you get a score for each of those. Um, approach is going to be called factor two, rigor and feasibility, and that is going to be scored. And then the other two investigators and environment are going to be factor three, expertise and resources, and that is not going to be scored. I want to um, just say before we go on, this is not this this does not apply to K submissions. This is an R series um, change, um, and for those who don't know, there's a new form set that's going into effect um, on January 25th. It's going to be form set I, and there are all kinds of changes there. Um, so if you're like somebody who writes T32s, there are changes to uh, several of the tables, um, and. You know, the scoring criteria or the headline here for um, the, the R series applications um, later in the year, they're going to be implementing changes to uh, later in 2025, they're going to implement changes to the bio sketch. So um, brace yourself. There's a lot coming. So, but today I really want to dig deeply into, um, into factor one. So let's do that. Oh, hold on a second. Zoom is giving me all kinds of messages I don't want. All right, so um, my team and I are in the middle of writing a series of blog posts on these changes, and um, they're, I had to break them into separate blog posts because I have a lot to say about each of these scoring criteria. So um, this is a table that is going to be in a blog post about factor one. And so remember, this is going to be significance and innovation are going to be collapsed into a single scored criteria called importance of the research. So for reference, the, and this table is going to appear in that blog post. We're not ready to publish it yet because I'm just still like just spewing editorial on this in the in the draft as I'm getting ready to update the Master of the Art Series um, slide deck for the boot camp next, uh, next week. And so just stay tuned. The blog post will be coming out later this month when I'm when I'm done um, editorializing on this change. So um, for reference, these were the old scored criteria. I, and most of you on uh, who are viewing this will will recognize 
um, them. I found it really helpful to have a side by side like this. So the first thing I want to do is um, take a look at the um, the significance criteria. Can people read this? Is this large enough for people to see? Uh, let's see if I can increase it. Zoom in a little. There you go. Is that that may be a little better? Okay. So um, the new scored criteria and significance, there aren't a lot of big surprises there. Um, you're going to see, and and I, what I want to preface this conversation by saying is that whenever I read scoring criteria on any grant application anywhere, it doesn't matter if it's a foundation, a federal agency, NIH, anywhere, um, the way you build your outline and your headers and subheaders should be off the scoring criteria because you have to always think of reviewer behavior, right? So in this instance, review, what is reviewer behavior? You're going to have, at least at the first level of review, you're gonna have a group of like 25 or 30 people sitting in a room. Um, three people will have read the application ahead of time and they will be presenting it to the rest of the people. But mostly people are just kind of skimming an application that they haven't sat down and read front to back quietly. Um, they're skimming it and they have a scoring sheet in front of them. So they're trying to match their scoring sheet to what's in the application, make that job easy for them by taking the scoring criteria and using those items to create your, your headers within that section. So what headers are you going to use in significance? You're going to see a lot of our, our usual suspects here, right? So the first item is evaluate the importance of the proposed research in the context of current scientific challenges and opportunities, either for advancing knowledge within the field or more broadly. Assess whether the application addresses an important gap in knowledge in the fields, would solve a critical problem or create a, value, uh, a valuable conceptual or technical advance. So just from those, it's the the headers are going to remain the same pretty much, right? So the kinds of headers you might see in the opening paragraphs of a significant section are typically background, clinical problem, somewhere there's going to be um, a bolded knowledge gap um, or clinical need. Sometimes people use that phrase. Um, um, background isn't my is it's not my favorite opening. Um, header because I think it's a little boring. Sometimes I put um, the um, critical problem or clinical problem I'll use as the opening and then um, talk about, you know, if there's a an obvious disease application, I'll start out with um, disease burden information, you know, so morbidity, mortality, cost, that kind of thing. Um, and then I might move to the scientific background section um, with a knowledge gap. So, um, and, and some high level brief summary of how your application um, proposes to address that knowledge gap and, um, the, and the clinical problem. And then the second one is evaluate the rationale for undertaking the study, the rigor of the scientific background for the work, prior literature and or preliminary data and whether the scientific background justifies the proposed um, study. So again, these are the usual suspects, right? Rigor of prior research, there it is. It's still, it's still there. It's still in the instructions. It's still in the scoring criteria. And um, as we've discussed in the past, that may or may not include a discussion of your preliminary data, which may be exhaustive or may be brief, um, and then referring to reviewers to the exhaustive discussion within the approach section, and some discussion of the rationale. And I, I tend to always put some sort of an impact statement at the end as well, um, so that there's like this, my personal favorite way to do this, I'll just say it that way, there are many ways to skin a cat, but this is my personal way to do this, and it's not going to change under the new scored criteria, is to start out with some sort of like, what what is the problem? What's the problem you're trying to address? So that might be called a critical problem or a clinical problem or clinical need or something like that, where you give a brief, brief recap of the uh, disease burden information. Um, then I might give some sort of um, background information, scientific background information, and then a knowledge gap. And then I might have a brief statement about how the project um, proposes to fill that knowledge gap and some sort of discussion of the rigor of prior research, um, and then an impact statement. That's 
typically how I structure um, the uh, significance section. I include a number of different um, templates in the Master of the Art series course if you want to look at some other ways to do it. But it's usually some variation on that theme. And I don't see that changing as we move into the new scoring criteria. So um, so um, there was one other thing I was going to say. Um, what was it? Uh, it'll come to me. Um, so anyway, that's, that's um, I don't see that changing. Innovation. This is where we're, I have, there's a very exciting change here. I'm really excited about this. So the, um, the old innovation um, scoring criteria are here. You're all familiar with what those are. And the new one are here. I'm actually just going to move this down so that um, it's all on a, uh, the same page. There we go. Okay. So actually, let me get the old scoring criteria down there too. Okay, there we go. Old scoring criteria, new scoring criteria. So the first of the two bullets in this new scoring criteria, which makes me want to like jump up and clap, evaluate the extent to which innovation influences the importance of undertaking the proposed research. Note that while technical or conceptual innovation can influence the importance of the proposed research, a project that is not applying novel concepts or approaches may be of critical importance to the field. Yes, thank you so much. So there has always been advice to reviewers um, that in theory, an applicant didn't necessarily need to score high on the innovation section to, ha to have a fundable project, you know, because the bottom line is that you know, sometimes you're proposing a project and the most scientifically sound way to conduct that project is it using tried and true tools, not something new and different and innovative, but something tried and true. And in theory, reviewers received guidance that um, that was okay, that, you know, like they shouldn't... Um, factor that um, into um, the overall impact score, for example, that sometimes that is in the, the appropriate way to go about doing something. However, in practice, the instructions and the scoring criteria in the old system never contained that language. It was just advice to re that reviewers got. The instructions and scoring criteria never contained that language. And I think we all know that in practice, if you received a poor score on innovation because you were using tried and true techniques, no matter how scientifically sound that reasoning was, um, it made it really hard to get a good impact score and to get funded. And it created a dilemma for applicants because, you know, like, what are you supposed to do if like you're proposing a project where it absolutely makes sense to use the tried and true um, approaches and methods? Here, it's the headline. It's the very first of two bullets in the innovation scoring criteria, basically saying, tell us whether, whether it really makes sense for you to be using innovative strategies. And so in, the, in this instance, it invites the applicant to say, in this particular project, the most um, scientifically sound thing to do is to use tried and true um, tried and true." Um, methods. So of course, you're going to have to see how reviewers score it. But the other way to de-emphasize this innovation piece is to collapse it with significance and give it a single scoring criteria. So I think that was part of the reason why they've done this. That and the other thing is that I, I find that still after all these years, a lot of my applicants struggle to differentiate um, which material goes under significance and which material goes under innovation. So in this instance, it makes it a little bit easier for you because if you fall into that category, you could always write your application where instead of breaking it out, significance and innovation, you could just have a single header that's as important of the importance of the research and write it as in one piece. You're, it'll be fine to do that, I think. Um, the second bullet is evaluate whether the proposed work applies novel concepts, methods, or technologies, or uses existing concepts, methods, technologies, and novel ways to enhance the overall impact of the project. So basically, I think like this entire old scoring criteria got mushed into this bullet. And then this headline bullet is the piece that says, 
is it should we even be worried about whether you're using innovative methods like is it a problem and for some of you the answer is going to be no we're not using innovative methods and that's scientifically sound and here's why so anyway that is my take on oh gosh and it's 322 so i've i've got to wrap this up so i can answer your questions but um you can tell that i'm a little passionate about this and um, this blog post is, um, it's just going to be on factor one because I have even more to say about it than that. Um, but uh, so stay tuned for the blog post. I'm still drafting it. I'm I'm still editing A1s and preparing for boot camp next week. So um, I'm, I'm trying to kind of wrap my head around cycle one of 2025. Um, okay. So as I said, we had some email questions and I see questions in the um in the Q&A. So let me answer some of these questions. I want to know about a K99 R00 fellowship. I did my PhD in 2021, um, January in India. While due to COVID, I started postdoc in US in March 2022. I wanted to ask until when am I eligible to apply for the K99 R00? I would ask the, uh, the program officer that question. Um, I think you could easily make a case for your eligibility uh, window being expanded based on the scenario you just laid out, um, but I would just make a thousand percent sure uh, that the program officer agrees. So, um, okay, I am submitting a grant in response to an RFA. Is it possible to know what study sections in the grant in the last cycle of the RFA were reviewed by? Is it reviewed at a SEP? Are you asked for a letter of intent? Let me ask you that. The person who asked the RFA question, are you asked for a letter of intent? Um, and the reason that I'm asking that is that if you're asked for a letter, so an RFA, just for people who don't know, is um, it's not a line item in the NIH budget. It tends to be a, a like a recurring line item in the NIH budget, like the parent R01 is, right? It's an RFA tends to be a finite pot of money and the, when the, the money's gone, the RFA goes away. Um, they often don't allow resubmissions. Um, some RFAs do recur across cycles and some are renewed, but that is typically the way they work. Um, a lot of them are reviewed at ad hoc panels called special emphasis panels. Um, and you um, typically know that that's happening if they ask for a letter of intent, because the letter of intent um, is typically used for by program staff to plan um, the, the, the ad hoc review panel. Um, so typically you can't see the roster um, for a special emphasis panel. However, this RFA, you're implying that it's gone, gone um, across cycles, that it's not like a single uh, receipt date, like a lot of RFAs are, but um, that it it has recurred across at least um, two cycles. So I don't know if the panel is available. Um, you could ask the program officer um, for that RFA if it's available, or if you know somebody who submitted to the last one and has a written set of summary statements, the panel will be at the back of the summary statements. So you could ask them um, to for the for the list of reviewers. That's the other possible way that you could do it if you happen to know somebody who applied in the last cycle. I um, mean, you could ask them for that list of reviewers without looking at their summary statements. You're not necessarily asking to see their scores, but you know, at the back of every set of summary statements um, is a list of the of the uh, roster, the review panel. Um, so that's another way you could do it. But I would just ask the program officer if that's available somewhere. Um, do you have any resources specific to renewal applications? So um, I um, I have, I want to say two Ask the Grant Writing Expert past sessions where I talked about competing renewals and how to write a progress report. Um, so Meredith, that should, you can either look on our YouTube channel, our YouTube channel is open to the public and um, the questions are time stamped there or we have recordings of um, all these AGE sessions on your dashboard as well. But I, I think I did, um, because I got that question so much, I did two in quick succession way back when I had when I launched the channel at least a year ago, I wanna say, but um, I, I think I even gave a template for how to write a competing renewal. Um, so go ahead and, and, and look for that. If you can't find it, just email me and I'll send you a link to the recording. 
Has the NIH provided you any details on when they will roll out the new biosketch and other supporting forms, which will take effect on March 25th? No. I know as much as you guys do. Um, so, um, and I'm not sure the program officers have been told. <laughs> There's a lot going on at NIH right now. So for those who don't know, October 1 is the start of the fiscal year. So trying to get an answer out of anybody at NIH right now um, is you know, they're coming out of their like hell week, you know, like they, it's, you know, they not only do they have the cycle two deadlines, but they they just submitted their um their uh, appropriations report requests and are, you know, like they're it, they're in that um process of of trying to get approval. So I know as much as you guys do about that. And I'm I'm honestly I'm I'm like so focused on the the change to the scoring criteria and the change to the T32 tables that I haven't even like thought about the biosketch changes because it's not today's worry. <laughs> so I will keep you guys posted about that though. Um, okay, let's see. Somebody said, correction, if NIH encourages a PI to convert their R01 to a MIRA instead of submitting an R01 renewal, what does that mean in terms of deadlines and new renewal status of a proposal? So the MIRA, um, it's, I believe is the seven years, right? Isn't that the seven year? Uh, is this a, which MIRA <laughs> are we talking about? So, um, so I think this is, you're asking me about when, if you're converting a five-year R01 to a seven-year MIRA, I think you just answered the main MIRA, not MIRA ESI. Um, so this is the seven-year, right? So you're converting from a five-year R01 to a seven-year MIRA. Um, you, you, would, you would, at the end of that time, you would, I think you still renew as an R01. I believe that coming out of a MIRA, you still renew as, it would be like a competing renewal of your R01 because the MIRA is like a special case of an R01. It's like a specialized type of R01. But I believe you can still write a competing renewal off of a MIRA. Double check with your program officer about that, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Um, do you have a suggested strategy for when there are split opinions between reviewers in the summary statement on an R01, one very favorable, one unfavorable, and one lukewarm? I think it was asked this last time, and it may be a different person because this scenario comes up all the time and it sucks. I just, like when I read these summary statements where I see these split opinions, I just kind of take a deep breath and cringe and it's a pain in the butt because, um, you know, it, you can't, there's no easy answer here. So the first question I usually ask a client when I see this kind of a split opinion is um, whether it's the appropriate study section um, in their opinion. Um, is there a more appropriate study section or do they feel like um, it's a good idea to stay at this study section, but maybe only one person really had the appropriate expertise um, to review. So um, in that second instance, the thing to do is when you resubmit, request the same study section, but ask the SRO if um, you could have um, an ad hoc reviewer that represents a certain type of missing expertise. And that might bump out one of these reviewers who didn't get the application. Um, you can't ask, there's nothing you can do otherwise to get that, that unfavorable reviewer um, out of the list of assigned reviewers, because it may just be a scientific difference of opinion. But if you feel like they didn't have, they really didn't know the content to appropriately score the application, then you could ask for an ad hoc reviewer with the missing expertise. Um, the other thing is if it, I mean, it sounds like it was discussed, maybe it wasn't, maybe it's just the, it was triage and these were the three written critiques. But the other thing you can do is call the program officer and have a discussion if they if they attended the discussion, um, ask them what their opinion is about how to handle the resubmission. Because sometimes the um, PO who is not allowed to speak, they sit on the sidelines, um, they take extensive notes typically, and they may have a different take on um, the discussion in the room because the written critiques, 25 or 30 people discuss it. You only get in the detailed written critiques of three of those people, the three assigned reviewers, but it, they may not be fully reflective of the discussion in the room. And so sometimes having a conversation with a program officer can be hugely helpful. 
Um, but yeah, my heart goes out to you. I, I absolutely hate when that happens. Um, oh, and here's the other person. Sorry, it is not an RFA, just a funding announcement. Well, an RFA is a type of funding announcement, but it sounds like maybe what you're talking about is a parent announcement. I want to know which study sections will likely review my proposal by finding study sections that reviewed grants under the same funding announcement in the past submission cycle. Um, I I need more information about like when you say it's not an RFA, it's a funding announcement. Like uh, if it's a parent, if it's a parent or a one, there are hundreds of study sections that review that me that that mechanism that NOFO. So if it's a, if it, I mean, there is a way to, um, I think there's a way to search for this in the reporter website, but I need more detail uh, on what you're asking. I need to know what kind of, if it's a topic specific funding announcement, and I still don't have the key piece of information is whether or not they asked for a letter of intent. Is there a letter of intent requested on this um, announcement? Cause that changes everything. Cause that means it's probably not a standing study section. Um, what is usually the main reason why a scored R01 application becomes not discussed on resubmission? <laughs> oh, bad luck. Um, it, different set of reviewers is typically, there are two main reasons. One is that you have a completely different set of reviewers who have a completely different set of issues with um, the application. And sometimes that can happen if the reviewers rotated off or are sitting out that cycle and you don't have a lot of control over that. The other thing is if you did not, respond to the critiques and you would be shocked at how many people resubmit and don't respond to the critiques. I'm always shocked at how many people do that. So those are probably the two um, main reasons that I see for um, people getting triaged, um, but it sucks. It really sucks. It, it, it's often that issue of like, it's a whole new set of reviewers, you know, and they just, they just have a different set of problems. And if you feel like it's the, it's the right study section, it's, it's an iterative process. You know, you keep submitting and hoping that you get the right combination, like the right timing and the right combination of reviewers. It's a, it's really hard. Um, okay, let's see. Did that, did that. Let's see. Okay, the PI has an R01 and received an email encouraging them to convert to a mirror instead of submitting a renewal R01. Usually you can... I would call the program officer and ask what they what they're asking you to do because usually you convert to maybe they want to see it go in as a mirror. I would call the program officer. Mirror is five years instead of the typical three to four. Um, yeah, if they got that email, I would respond to it and and ask for a um a conversation with the program officer um to ask why they requested that. We do have AGE sessions on the R35, by the way, um, where we compare the different types of um, R35s because um, there are different institutes that sponsor different R35s and and they're all a little different and they change all the time. So um, you could go back and look at the recording of the R35. I actually presented a table of the different types of R35s by institute and how they compare Okay, um, I know we're going over. If people need to leave, feel free. Um, is there a recommended point at which someone is too far along in their career for a K and should be submitting for R's? More info, I submitted in 2021 and resubmitted 2022. A K, which were both scored but not funded. I was able to get a USDA Young Investigator grant. So now some of my mentors are wondering if I am beyond the K. Um, so my guess is you are. Um, so I pers there's no hard and fast rule. I personally keep an uh, an eagle eye on your ESI time because I am a firm believer that um, a person should be really, and I, I don't know your institute, you didn't say the institute here, but um, the ESI funding advantage is substantial. So like uh, the NCI um, bump in the percent funded is seven percentile in, 20, in FY24. And there's no reason to think it's going to go down in FY25, 7%. So like, that's a huge difference. So you want to make sure that you're giving yourself a big enough runway to putting several R01s, because as you can tell from these conversations, it's an iter iterative process. So um, you want to leave yourself enough time to submit the R01 two or three times while you still have your ES, I'd say three times while you still have your ESI status so that you're getting an A0 in just before it expires. But um, my guess is that um, you're probably past the K point 
And um, if you're not quite at the point of an R01, either wait a year or two or put in for like an R21 just for the hell of it, which won't eat away at your, um, your ESI time. Um, okay, that person said no letter of intent, special topic announcement of the parent one. Um, so if there's no letter of intent, um, you might be the one to choose the study section, and it probably was reviewed at multiple different standing study sections. You could confirm that with the program officer, but that's the likely scenario. So um, in preparation for that call with the program officer, go on CSR ART, select your um, one or two possible study sections that look like they would be a good fit for your application. And then ask the program officer, like you don't ask for a letter of intent. So I'm assuming we choose the study section um, on the assignment request form. Um, and if the answer is yes, then you can see the rosters of all the standing study sections. And you can have a conversation with the program officer about um, the, the ones that you chose and what they think would be best. Um, oh, we're almost, we're not almost at the bottom. <laughs> sorry, folks. If people have to go, feel free to go. I'm so sorry. Um, let's see, our research administrator told me that there is a budget section that can include costs associated with changes or adjustments in the research setting that will make it possible for an individual with a disability to perform the essential functions associated with their role. How does this have to be reflected? Uh, this is not a question for me. I don't do anything with budgets at all. I'm sorry. Um, this is, a, and it's a really good question, but I think um, this is not, it's not something I can answer. I have absolutely no idea um, what the answer is to this. Um, so I I would, um, again, call somebody at NIH. Um, I don't find their info line very helpful. I usually just go directly to the program office with all questions um, or ask other pre-award support offices if you're at a large place. I don't know where, where you're located, but if you're at a large place with a lot of pre-award support um, or some sort of centralized RD, have them chase that the answer to this down for you because that's their job, that's what they're there for. Um, Okay, I got a close to pay line score in an A1 and the PO mentioned that my grant will be discussed at the advisory council for potential funding over the pay line. When is it a good time to contact the PO again to ask about the meeting outcome? It has been three weeks already since the meeting and I am submitting as new on October 5th to avoid missing a cycle. I think you could reach out now and ask, you know, like they may still be figuring out um, whether you know, like they may be thinking about whether or not it could be funded in the new fiscal year. You're in this weird changeover because in theory, I well, the old fiscal year ended on September 30th and um, they don't have a budget yet for um, October 1st. So um, they're in this kind of weird position, but um, I would ask them how the conversation went and let them know that you're planning to submit for October 5th so you don't miss the cycle. Um, and and whether um, you could have multiple active applications in ERA Commons, it's an MAA designator, which would mean that even if you're submitting um, the A0, they might still, and it's essentially the same project, they might still keep the A1 um, for, for funding consideration in ERA Commons. So it's an MAA, multiple active application designation. What difference does it make with a letter of intent? So the letter of intent is, um, as I said, it's the it's due 30 days before um, the um, application deadline and the program staff um, use it to plan the review panel. So it's helpful for them because they know how many um, applications they're getting. They get a sense of where they're coming in from, what the topic areas are, because they have to they have to pick um, certain types of expertise to be represented on the panel. It helps you because you can communicate what expertise you need <laughs> on that represented on that panel. So even though it doesn't ask for this in the directions for the letter of intent, um, I would say, because it'll ask for things like, what's the title? What's your organization? Um, what's Who are the uh, PIs? It'll ask for things like that. What you need to communicate, which isn't in the instructions, is the types of expertise you need represented on the panel to get a fair and impartial review. That is the single most important piece of information you can convey on a letter of intent for your purposes, not for theirs, but for your purposes. And um, I absolutely always encourage people to submit the, the letter of intent. 
Okay, so 10 minutes over. I'm so sorry. And I did not get um, to the to the emailed questions. I'll very quickly say, um, Chris, you should definitely include preliminary data on the R21. Um, and if you want, I'll answer that in detail in two weeks. But if you want detail, just email me. Um, I don't know if you're applying for the October deadline. Um, so that would be October 16th is the R21 deadline. Um, and there were a couple of others that came in the under survey responses that I'll address next time. But y'all had a lot of questions. And I talked a lot about the, the scoring criteria. So next week, folks, we'll or two weeks from now, we'll talk about the factor two scoring criteria, which is what approach is morphing into. Um, very interesting changes there concerning the heavy, heavy emphasis on rigor. So we're going to do uh, a side-by-side -side comparison of those. And otherwise, thank you so much, as always, for your support. You guys are great. I can't believe how long everybody stayed on. <laughs> I hope to see some of you on Friday at First Fridays, and I hope to see some of you next Thursday at the K Boot Camp or the Thursday after at the start of the R Boot Camp. And um, other than that, I wish everyone um, the very best of luck in their grant writing, and I will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.